I mean, one of, one of the issues that I just want to um, maybe raise now for the three of you to consider when we come back is um, you've talked a lot about um, establishing uh, a framework, um, a sort of civic vision of what the cities that you've talked about might be like. You haven't talked very much because of time, I'm sure, about how the main actors who actually act in the city, private developers, relate to that. And I think that's an important uh, issue to be discussed because it's that negotiation, that mediation, uh, which can either go very right or, as we've often seen, very wrong. Just thinking again at Alejandro's, Zairopolo's previous images uh, in, in, in the previous session. Now, to uh, discuss uh, and to contribute to um, enlarging the debate, we have uh, four, uh, I think, extremely interesting speakers, very diverse uh, commentators, and Corin and I will um, bring them in at uh, different points. Um, Anthony Williams, uh, as you gather, has been the mayor of Washington at a crucial time, <clears throat> is now, in fact, um, interestingly, at the Kennedy School of Government, uh, running a course on how to run cities, effectively, which I think is uh, I intriguing and uh, an important action. Can I ask uh, Tony to comment? Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I thought all the presentations, as usual, were very, very good. And I, I think just the overall uh, presentation in Istanbul here has been just remarkable. So I salute all the presenters. And I'll just spend three minutes so we will have uh, time for discussion, enough time for me to earn my way here, but not so much as to suppress discussion. You know, when I, I think when I became mayor, I think uh, what I face is actually typical of what I think most city leaders face around the world. Uh, one where the authority was really not taken, not to be taken for granted, where there was really a kind of lack of self-determination for your city as your authority was blurred, to say the least, with that of the national government. Uh, my citizens in my city didn't even have the right to vote, right, uh, for voting representation. For voting representation in the national legislature, we were a divided city, as Bruce Katz would tell you, uh, representative of so many cities in the United States and so many cities around the world, as we've heard. And last but uh, certainly not least, we were a dysfunctional city. Uh, nothing really worked. I'm talking about nothing. No, all the social service agencies were under a court order. So that's pretty much what I inherited. Uh, so got into uh, uh, uh, the job, and I was, a, uh, one, impressed by the city and the, and the kind of reason for being for the city, read all the histories of the city, and uh, came, upon, came upon the acquaintance of Andrew, who schooled me in the building blocks of a city. You know, great streets, as we've heard from Enrique Pinalosa, are uh, heart and blood of your city, your arteries of your city, your downtown, the core of your city, uh, your neighborhoods, as we've heard from Richard Rogers, you know, and how these neighborhoods are the building blocks of a, of a great city. And lastly, uh, a waterfront. But how do you make this happen? How do you actually take a vision and make it a reality? I would give you three dimensions. One is a dimension of authority and recognize that your authority uh, is not over, not only over your government, but over what I would call and what we've heard from Richard Sennett, uh, the public realm. It includes the government, but is not limited to the government. It is the government and the non-governmental. It is the private and the collective are under your realm, but you have to use your authority sparingly. It's kind of like a nozzle. Build up your pressure so that you can focus that authority and deploy it wisely and prudently. And one, understand that there is no distinction between a vision and management. I hate it when people say, well, he's a great, or he or she's a great leader, but they can't manage anything, or he or she's a great, they say, about this, say this about me. Tony was a great manager, but he wasn't a leader. No, you have to do both, right? I tell my students the difference between good management and bad management is like American Samoa, where they spent $50 million for a tsunami warning they didn't put the tsunami warning in place. They didn't have good management, which we don't care about. And people died. Billions of dollars stolen from your country because you didn't have good management. Zillions of dreams didn't become reality because you didn't have good management. Sorry to preach, but important. Number two, build consensus with your people. Not build consensus with your people. We had these citizen summits of 4,000 people. Not so I just slavishly listened to all the people but recognize that prudently using your authority over this public realm as to say that I'm going to follow the 60-40 or 70-30 rule. I will listen and smart salutely to my people 60 or 70 percent of the time, and 30 percent of the time in a transparent way I will let my people know 
that they elected me to make the final decision, right? Now, I'm not final because I'm infallible, but I am infallible because I'm final, if you know what I mean. And then lastly, focus on three things, right? If you try to lead with 40 things, it's not going to get anywhere, but focus on three things. And so me, it was res basically restoring right, the government services of the district. To me, that was part of your authority because it was essentially punching the meal ticket. If you can't answer the phones, no one will listen to you about anything else. Restore respect for the city. And number three, the Anacostia River. So in terms of taking a vision for your city and making it reality, if you make it one, if you build your authority and build your apparatus to execute it and focus on that thing relentlessly over and over again until you are sick of hearing it, it's probably penetrating your constituency. And then number two on the programmatic, this notion of integration of the physical and social could not be more true. You know, I hate it when people say, well, the physical is important or the social is important. Both are important. And I'll leave enough said on that. I think we all agree with that. And then lastly, I would focus on the issue of time and understand that in, when you're talking about a vision for your city, think of the time dimension. So for example, in Washington, D.C., in the short-term dimension, Andrew worked on these short-term action plans for the neighborhoods. This is kind of like punching the meal ticket. Get, the neighborhoods now are bought into our broader vision for the city because we're taking care of basic things that go to making quality of life in the neighborhoods better. And then in the medium term, I would put things like the Anacostia River as a medium-term project. And then in the longer term, and no one ever talks about this, and I'm happy they didn't because it was the most important, I think, in the long term, we put in a new comprehensive plan for the city. So if you look at many beautiful cities around the world, it's not because they have just one or two beautiful buildings, it's because they have put in place a regime that has actually beautified and burnished this, the, the public space, this public realm, year after year, decade after decade, and we are able to do that. So think of that. Think of that time dimension. Think of that notion of integrating the social and the physical, and by all means, think of how you properly ex exercise, well, accumulate, exercise, and deploy your authority, limited as it is. Tony, let me just ask you one question. Do you then believe in the notion that um, a civic leader such as yourself should back a very long-term plan for a city, or because of the pace of change and the real reality of what we see in most cities is that actually nothing really gets done in the same uh, in the way that the plan is intended. I, I think you should try, no, I think you should try to build long-term plans, but I think the route toward that long-term plan is to build credibility with the short term, apply it to the median term, and then if you're lucky, begin working on the long term. But many people start on the long term without any foundation, I believe. Sorry, on this important point of timing, uh, you didn't have time to talk about this, but what are the first things that you would like to see implemented? Because many of the things you showed are very, very long-term, long structural change, massive investment. The, very, very briefly, what are, are the, the short-term things that you think could change and deal with the quality of life issue, which is, I think, yeah, Tony? Uh, I think the couple of very first things is, of course, uh, we have uh, transportation difficulties, and there's a need, lots of uh, railway system constructions to be done in Istanbul. And then uh, that takes lots of money and the time. But uh, I'm sure that in, uh, sometime in the future we will solving that. But secondly, the, one of the uh, very important issues <coughs> is that uh, I don't know how much the side of the Istanbul you've seen, but we have uh, lots of collapsed areas too. So uh, these areas need to be uh, redesigned and uh, lots of renovation or regeneration projects should be carried out there. But again, uh, here uh, we have a different mentality than the Western uh, situation. Here uh, our people uh, sometimes believe in fortune and then they just live with their fortune and they don't want any progress to come up. So these are our difficulties. I think uh, there needs a lot of uh, propaganda uh, to be done about that. Uh, <coughs> please, headphones, uh, I will speak in Turkish. Uh, şimdi çok önemli bir noktaya geldik. Uh, bu uh, kent yönetimlerinin 
günümüzde değişen e, siyasi rolüyle ilgili temel bir e, noktaya e, belki <gülüyor> dokunmamız gerekiyor. O da şu, e, şimdi e, merkezi yönetimin siyasallaşması, siyasi şeyine karşılık, rolüne karşılık kent yönetimleri genellikle ikincilleştirilmiş bir durumda. Daha teknik bir iş yerine getiriyorlar, daha teknokratik bir iş yapıyorlar. Ne yapıyorlar? Ulaşım planı yapıyorlar. Ne yapıyorlar? İşte yerleşim alanlarını iyileştiriyorlar veya kazıyıp yeniden yapıyorlar. Yani onlara tanınan yol, yer, yerel yönetimlere tanınan yer aslında bir tür bir şube. Yani siyasal olarak fazla bir rolü olmayan teknokratik bir işlev yerine getiriyor yerel yönetimler. 20. yüzyılın genel olarak e, yerel yönetimlere tanıdığı rol. Şimdi bu rol nasıl olacak da bugün katılımcı e, ve daha entegre bir yönetim modeline doğru dönüşecek kent ölçeğinde politika üretebilen. Çünkü bu teknokratik modelin aslında görünüşte politik bir e, niteliği yokmuş gibi gözüküyor ama e, bunun üretmiş olduğu bir e, şey var. E, bir adeta 19. yüzyılın gerçeklerini 21. yüzyıla taşıyan bir mod modelle karşı karşıyayız. Yani müzakere alanı son derece daralmış durumda. Bu müzakere alanında ancak güçlü olan aktörler söz sahibi olabiliyor ve insanların, kentlilerin bu konuda e, sesleri çıkamıyor. Kentliler bu müzakere ortamının e, pasif aktörleri olarak e, bir şekilde bir boyunduruk altına girmiş durumdalar. Şimdi karşımızda ta tartışmacılarımız arasında Erdoğan Yıldız var. Kendisi Gül Gülen Su ve Gül Suyu mahallelerinde e, bu mahalle inisiyatiflerinin de aynı zamanda temsilcisi olarak burada. Ama aynı zamanda bu mahallelerdeki gerçekleşen kentsel dönüşüm e, operasyonlarının mağdurlarından biri. Ben kendisine sözü veriyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Şimdi bu kadar etkileyici konuklar arasında gerçekten böyle bir ortamda bulunmak bayağı heyecan verici. E, ben Söylemem aslında Shakespeare'in bir sözüyle başlamak istiyorum. Der ki, kent dediğin nedir ki insandan başka? Yani e, bir gözlerinizi kapatın. Eğer kentte yaşamak insanı mutlu etmiyorsa, insanları o kent yaşamına, kentteki durumlara söz ve karar sahibi olarak içine almıyorsa, o kentte mutlu olmak kolay değildir. E, ben burada doğdum, İstanbul'da doğdum. Bir kızım, bir oğlum var. Onlar da İstanbullu. Ama bugün bizim oturduğumuz mahallelerde yoksulluk ve kente entegre olamamaktan kaynaklı e, bizlere işgalci ya da buralara yakışmayan yoksul gözüyle bakılıyor. Ve bu da kentin vizyonunda ve gelecekteki planlarında çok ciddi gerilimler ortaya çıkartıyor. E, 50'li 60'lı yıllarda bu kent ciddi anlamda sanayi kentiydi. Ve bu sanayi kenti olmasından kaynaklı da Bizim babalarımız, annelerimiz köylerden buralara geldiler, burada çalışmaya başladılar. Biz buralı olduk, buralarda bir kültür oluşturduk. Bu mahalleler bizim mahallelerimiz oldu, kent bizim kentimiz oldu. Ama bugün sanayi kentinin dışında artık İstanbul finans merkezi olmaya başladı. İstanbul hizmet ağırlıklı sektörlerin kenti olmaya başladı ve burada bizim gibi ucuz iş gücüne ihtiyaç kalmadı. Bundan kaynaklı e, centrifike edilen bir durum yaşıyoruz. Yani yoksulların kent dışına gönderilip kentin ciddi anlamda orta ve üst kesimlere hizmet edildiği bir süreç yaşanıyor. Şimdi e, ben kısaca süreci özetlemek istersem Maltepe'de Gül suyunda başı büyükte kentsel dönüşüm süreçleri böyle sancılı yürüyor. İşte Sulu Kule gözümüzün önünde oradaki roman mahallesi kent dışına kaydırıldı. Ayazma, Bezirgen Bahçe denilen kent dışındaki bloklara sığdırılmaya çalışıldı. Sarıyer'in bir sürü mahallesi bu kentsel dönüşüm riski içinde ve bizlerde yani burada oturanlara bu kentin yeni yönetiminde, yeni vizyonunda sözde karar sahibi tanınmıyor. Planlar yapılırken buradaki insanlara bir mahalleli değil bir nesne gözüyle bakılıyor. Sanki planlar sadece uzmanların, şehir plancıların ve mimarların işiymiş gibi biraz önce İbrahim Bey'in bahsettiği gibi çok teknik, çok pragmatik ve çok şey gözüyle bakılıyor kente. E, teknokrat bir yönetim gözüyle bakılıyor ve buradaki insanlar planlamanın içinde bir nesne olarak görülüyor. Planın bir parçası olarak görülüyor ve bu dediğim gibi bu dönüşüm süreci içinde çok ciddi gerilimlere yol açıyor. Ee, kısaca mahallelerimizde ve ilimizde bu kentte uygulama şöyle yapılıyor. Örneğin belediye bir mahalleye bir bölgeye planlama için gittiğinde oradaki 
gece kondulara, oradaki evlere bir enkaz değeri biçiliyor. Bu enkaz değeri üzerinden kendi TOKİ konutlarını satmaya çalışıyor. Yani asıl olarak o insanların daha müreffeh, daha mutlu yaşayabileceği bir mahalle formu nasıl kurulacağı değil, o insanların o mahallelerden kaldırılıp, daha başka yerlere, daha e, toplu konutlara sığdırılması, onların içine giydirilmesi, onların içine yaşatılması isteniyor. İşte bu gerilim bizim mahallelerimiz açısından kabul edilemez bir gerilimdir. Ve esas olarak da bu kentin sahipleri olmamıza rağmen kentin vizyonunda, kentin misyonunda, kentin gelişiminde bizlerin karar mekanizmalarının dışında kalmamız çok ciddi bir problem ve sorunsallık teşkil ediyor. Teşekkür ederim. As you hear from the room, you put your finger on it. Um, I, I think uh, I, I visited uh, Erdogan's community uh, a few months ago, and um, while, of course, we understand the strength of feeling, there was also a lot of optimism in some of uh, the ideas and the way you were able in your community to actually mobilize support, and I was encouraged that, in fact, you were at that point about to work with uh, one of the universities and one of the schools of architecture to try and improve the environment around you for you and um, the local um, community that you represent so strongly. I guess this is the only sort of um, situation that an outsider, not an insider, can uh, perhaps in a non-controversial and absolutely non-provocative way is to ask Ibrahim whether you feel that the plan as it now stands, the master plan, is able to deal with these um, issues. And th this is not to defend but to say is it something that in the process that you are given within which you work, you're able to deal with these issues, or okay. is this the next stage? Well, uh, probably not the area the gentleman is living, but uh, the, some of the areas, uh, we pointed out them in our master plan as a special project areas. Uh, I think uh, there is uh, one, uh, I think, a conflict question, uh, that is, um, I mean, in one side, Istanbul is waiting one of the very big earthquakes to come, okay? On the other side, there are houses which inside the humans are living in, and then they are not in very good conditions. Probably without the earthquake, they may collapse immediately. So we have a situation. I mean, the choice yeah, but between... Just to put that isn't that around 70% of the city? Isn't that situation? Um, well, uh, could be, could be, right. could be. So uh, here uh, there are a couple of questions. In fact, we have to ask ourselves in any kind of regeneration projects. We have number of situations like this. First, I mean, we have kind of people. They still prefer to live in rural life conditions, although right in the center of the metropolitan city they are living in. So this is one of the choices. And the secondly, and, uh, if you ask people, would you like to prefer better quality life or the same quantity of the life? They will give the answer, the quantity. So that is another difficulty. I mean, and again, all people are waiting without spending any money. They want to get the same amount of the area and the conditions they are having at the moment for the future. So I don't know how it's going to be sorted out. Thank you for that. Could I bring in Albert um, Speer at this point? Uh, Albert has, um, runs a practice in Germany which um, in many ways is grappling with parts of this discussion, uh, but very much in, in, a, uh, in, in, in the new emerging worlds of new towns in China and, and elsewhere, where in some case there is not even a dialogue, a political dialogue, simply because of the political system. Uh, can you say something about, uh, from what, uh, commenting on what you've heard, on what you think perhaps is the right process to achieve the sorts of um, environments that, you know, work at multi-levels and not just at the level of making someone very rich? 
Yeah, <clears throat> I think first we have to uh, see the role urban planners have in the world. It's not the most important, important uh, role. Uh, in my thinking, we are a consultant to society and the role we are playing is minor. The influences of uh, politics, economics, and uh, the society are uh, very, very large. And uh, if you count this in sectors, I always say the sector we are responsible for are perhaps 5% of all decisions which lead to the development of Istanbul or Washington. Uh, Second, I would like to say that, that the developments in, in Africa or Asia, uh, uh, China, they are completely different from the approach, from the, the origin than what we are facing in Europe or in an old city like Istanbul or I am now working a lot in Cairo. Uh, uh, we are in China guests, we are working in a culture we don't really understand. And uh, we, uh, I think we have to behave also as guests. But uh, they are listening to us. And, and uh, uh, it's not uh, that uh, the decisions in China are only made uh, from top down there are a lot of decisions taken on the, on the city level and, and, and bottom up. So the system is another system as our democratic system, but it's not an absolute regime of, of you persons. Um, uh, I'm commenting what uh, uh, I have seen here, I think it is most important that all parts of society are involved from the beginning. And uh, uh, this means that urban planning has to be intelligent, effective, and sensitive. And in many cases, architects and planners are not sensitive at all. They have some utopia ideas and put it on an area uh, without relations to the neighborhood, to the people, to the landscape, to the culture, to the environment, and all the other things. Um, I uh, think that for cities like Istanbul or cities like London, it is most important that, that uh, uh, decentralization is going on, that not everything is concentrated in one place, but uh, in many places. But this means, and this is done in London, that you have to have the opportunity of upgrading an area like East London. And there, world events are most helpful. And I am also in this business of bidding for world events from Qatar to Munich. And uh, uh, even if the city is losing, it's gaining a lot because this is bringing, or uh, this brings the opportunity also in politics to think in new ideas and to bring uh, new ideas in which otherwise uh, a politically uh, uh, uh, couldn't get through from the beginning. I think politics are most important and long-term thinking is most important, but at the same time, simultaneously, you have to do things for the people now. But uh, before I go to Tony Travers, as a master planner, okay, yes. you've reduced your responsibility to 5%, right? No. No, but, okay, uh, uh, but uh, uh, surely what you design has enormous impact in terms of the potential yeah, sure. engagement. So, sure. But only if all the other fields are integrated. 
it's not an artistic design. It's a design of, of uh, as you showed it, of integration of the whole society. And On this is our responsibility, I think, to, to, to think interdisciplinary and not as uh, uh, aesthetic people seeing only this part of the world. I'm sure we'll come back to that with Enrique Norton in the next session. But let me bring in Tony Travers before returning to Koran. Tony is a, a key commentator in London on all things uh, political. He's a colleague of mine at the London School of Economics. And perhaps uh, in what you say, Tony, you might even address the issue of how the multi-layered complexities, let's not forget Fita Bishop's plan, the circles in white on a black background, yeah. Those are all the people in London at the moment who need to get involved in a project. Uh, how one negotiates that. He did write the book, London Governing the Ungovernable City. So how do you deal with this, Tony? Yes, I realized after the publisher had suggested that struck line that John Lindsay had used it for a, a title of his uh, before, but never mind. Um, the, I mean, listening to the discussion, I was struck by one of Peter's early uh, charts which showed uh, an earlier version of what planners in London thought planning was all about and that of course was at a time when planning was a matter of experts and grandees yeah. and elite telling people what the city should be like that's what planners thought they were trying to do and I'm not saying all of that was implemented in that way but that was the way it was done I think all we've heard this afternoon is that planning and uh, so was it, guidelines for growth, have become about many, many more things. I mean, they're not just about conventional land use and zoning, the location of transport and roads, but they're about a huge list of other things as well, regenerating a declined uh, industrial land. In the case of Istanbul, moving the city from being an industrial or away from a predominantly industrial city towards... Uh, a financial center and a post-industrial city and diversifying the economy. But planning is also about aesthetics. Should there be tall buildings or no tall buildings and where the adornment of buildings we've heard earlier about today, density versus sprawl, how to fight people who don't want to change things for good reasons and some who want not to change things for bad reasons, and indeed to cope with social change more generally. And the whole idea of a guideline for growth or planning now embraces all of these things. This is a much, much wider notion of planning uh, than it ever would have been in the past. And I think it's such a wide list, of, a long list, that it actually begs the question of when it would be too much. I mean, when in a sense trying to do all of them distracts from each individual part of it. But the only other thing I think I'd like to say is that I'm absolutely struck by the fact that Anthony Williams, Enrique Penelos, and of course Juan Clos, who was here earlier, people who have successfully run major cities have come back one way or another, come to the same conclusion, and that is how do city leaders harness the developers, architects, community, city planners, all of the interests that were represented by uh, Peter Bishop's many circles in London, but any city could have drawn something a bit like that to create a civic coalition, or what I think in Barcelona they call complicity, uh, bringing people together so that they share an idea. So I think that how that is done, the coordinating and leading role by the articulate and the uh, effective politician to deliver a plan is absolutely essential. And that finally leads us back to the point that Anthony certainly made, and I think others have made, and that is that comes down to the authority and the, in fact, the elegant authority of the individual who has the mandate to deliver it. It's without politicians, and we have two here who've done it, but not all politicians are that good. But, Tony, you must address, though, the, I mean, I, I think we take that for granted. Without good politicians, we don't get good cities. Fine. But we've heard a moment ago a very clear uh, comment saying uh, that Perhaps there's a democratic deficit in a city uh, like this one, as in many others. Uh, this is a very live debate in London. There are a lot of people still feel excluded. 
Can you say a little bit about how you think uh, the London planning process, which uh, Peter and Andy are now very much involved in, uh, deals with that? L let me put in a cue. One of the views is uh, that East London is being regenerated for the first time ever for after 30, 40 years because all other attempts have failed. And the only way to do that is to take it out of the democratic process. And unfortunately, Andy is the chief executive of that machine, which is, has no democratic accountability really for the moment, right? Is that, is that a problem? Well, answer that. Well, no, well first, I mean, <laughs> it's such an obvious provocation. It's, it, it, I mean, for, first, I mean, it's not to, you know, I, I think it's, the question is, it's not really taken out of all democratic accountability. I mean, you know, you set up, I mean, I think part of the issue, you know, of what Peter's chart shows in a way is an enormous, who, who at the end is the interest because there are so many. So even let's take the company that's been set up to run the Olympics post the Olympic, uh, you know, after the games is a creature of the mayor, the government, will have representation from the boroughs, it'll have a lot of formal representation on its, that's formal representation on its board, let alone trying to get things done requires you to go through an enormous amount of the informal because of the influences of the borough. So I don't think, uh, I don't think it escapes that. I think it's a very interesting question of large scale projects of how much representation, I mean, Jeffrey raised this the other day of public authorities, which is, you know, people criticized, on one hand, Canary Wharf, on the other hand, uh, it wouldn't have gotten done, probably, without having, in a sense, been outside of normal democratic processes and established London as in a financial center. You can argue whether that's good for bad. So I think it's, I think it's striking a right balance, but I would go back to one point of it, which is maybe a very simple point, which, which, which has to do with the vision of what you're trying to accomplish because of that vision of what you're trying to accomplish and how, the, how that's articulated by the government and agreed and understood among people uh, in the city of what you're trying to do, I think that's very important from the foundation and we can often get lost in all the different mechanisms and go back to what are you trying to accomplish and how and whose city is this? Tony, and then go on. I just, Tony on this one point and then okay. I mean, the question of how to mediate local interests will, of course, vary from issue to issue. I mean, Enrique Penaloza this morning made an impassioned plea, in effect, occasionally, to override powerful interests, not necessarily local neighborhood ones, but there are times when to run a city properly, you have to use authority to push things through. So, it, so with use of roads or clean air, these are both issues where occasionally governments will have to take action which tramples on people's toes. Um, whereas a, to clear the Olympic site requires the use of what is elegantly known as eminent domain. I mean, actually sweeping people, neighborhoods off the site because otherwise nothing would have happened. I mean, the games couldn't have taken place. And is that good? Well, it's good for the city. It's not particularly good for the people who are swept off the site. And, you know, if there is an earthquake coming along, I can see there is a, a, a, a, a literally an insoluble political issue which at some level, as they always come back to the point I made, only politics can decide. Now in London, one of the ways we do it is by having powerful lower tier units of government. Gerald Frug would undoubtedly have a lot to say on this if he were on the panel. I mean, ways of allowing articulation of views from a neighborhood level, that has the consequence that the city-wide level of government is weaker, thus the, one of those charts that Peter Bishop put up. So um, in a sense, I still come back to the point, only politics and politicians can maneuver them because they have the magic ingredient of electoral legitimacy. So whatever level of government they're at, they have to do it. Şimdi burada çok e, gene temel bir konu var. E, bir e, fiziksel entegrasyondan söz ederken aynı zamanda siyasal entegrasyona de, değindi de, Altman'ın sunumunda. Şimdi tamam ama bu nasıl olacak? Yani işte bir araya getirdik, temsilcileri bir araya getirdik. Organlaşma tamam fakat 
uygulamada e, eğer kurumlar kendi teknokratik şeyleri içinde kalıyorlarsa söz gelimi işte deprem için riskleri azaltmak için ayrı bir kurum, ulaşım için ayrı bir kurum, su kaynaklarının korunması için ayrı bir kurum, enerji için ayrı bir kurum. Yani kentin bütün bu kamusal hayatı 20. yüzyılda olduğu gibi bu seksiyonlar halinde yürüyorsa uygulamada siz bunu yapamıyorsunuz. Her ne kadar koordinasyondan söz edin, istediğiniz kadar e, bu, bu entegrasyona yönelik adımlar atın, entegrasyonun maddi araçları gerçekleşmediği ölçüde sizin bütün bu hayalleriniz e, bu şeye benziyor. Yani bütünsel tasarım düşleri gibi, 19. yüzyılın bütünsel tasarım düşleri nasıl bugün fragmentasyona yol açıyor, bugün nasıl e, kapalı alanlar yaratıyor, aslında bundan farklı bir planlama düşü görmüyorsunuz. Bunu değiştirebilecek e, çabanın mutlaka eylemsel olması lazım diye düşünüyorum. Bunun danışmanlık statüsündeki bir şehircilik işleviyle de olmayacağı çok açık. Yani bizde e, çok severler işte hoca derler e, şeylere, <gülüyor> e, çok bilen insanlara. Onların hep e, değerli olduğu söylenir. Ama aynı zamanda da şu demektir bu. Siz konuşursunuz, iş yapmayı bilmezsiniz. Yani siz mimarlar, plancılar, hocalar, siz konuşmayı bilirsiniz, çizmeyi bilirsiniz ama iş yapmaya gelince onu biz teknokratlar daha iyi biliriz. Onun için siz yani şöyle biraz uzak durun demektir aslında. Şimdi bu bu modelden biz nasıl olacak da kültür yönetiminde yani vatandaşı özne haline getirebilecek bir yönetime geçebileceğiz. Yani burada çok stratejik bir alete ihtiyacımız var. Bu sadece lafla olmaz. Stratejik aletler, enstrümanlar kullanıyor bütün bu tip deneylere girişen kentler. Bence bundan dersler çıkarmalıyız. Yani bugün kentlerin kullandıkları bir takım deney şeyleri var. Bunların mükemmel olduğu söylenemez. Ama hiç olmazsa entegrasyona yönelik adımlar atılabiliyor. Biz de bu kültür başkenti programı ile aslında İstanbul'daki bu özne yokluğunu yani kamusal mekanların, kültür merkezlerinin, eski endüstriyel tesislerin özne yokluğunu, eski işlevini sürdüremeyen kamusallık e, modelini dönüştürmek için bir kültür başkenti programının bu e, aleti yani bu stratejik aleti kentin kendi geleceği üzerine düşünmek ve işlem yapmayı sağlayacak bir alet geliştirmeye çalıştık. Aynı sizin Londra'da yaptığınız gibi. Şimdi buradaki şey e, bence altı çizilmeli. E, bu entegrasyon, katılım, şeylerin farklı çıkar gruplarının, farklı kamu yararı kavramlarını temsil eden grupların temsilinin sadece e, istekle olmayacağını, burada e, entelektüel üretimi yapan profesyonellerin çok önemli bir rolü olduğunun altını çizmemiz lazım. O da bu ara yüzleri oluşturacak şekilde o şiddete karşı direnmeleri. Bu direnme nasıl olabilir? Bir tanesi ilişkisel bir modelle. İletişim kurmaları gerekiyor farklı bilgiler arasında yani kendi bilgisini işte deprem olacak yıkmamız lazım sizin evlerinizi yenileceğiz diyerek değil ilişkisel bakmaları gerekiyor başka istihdam konusuna bakmaları gerekiyor eğitim konusuna bakmaları gerekiyor yani artık disiplinler arasında çalışmak gerekiyor ikincisi de çoğulculuk gerekiyor yani ben bu projeyi yaparım başka model yok denemez mutlaka başka bir fikir olabilir sizin fikriniz çok değerlidir mutlaka ama Sulu Kule için mutlaka başka daha iyi bir projede olabilir diyebilmeli insanlar. Bu tip bir yarışmada olması, rekabet ortamında olması lazım diye düşünüyorum. Yes, I only want to say that that uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, that uh, in this case, events like the cultural capital of Europe is helping a lot because with these I ideal uh, thinking, you can get the people to follow you. And this is the same in London without the Olympic Games. All your projects wouldn't come into the politics and into in investment. And that's why I think these things are most important. Final comment, Peter Bishop. Obviously we're working in a very complex uh, society where the democratic consensus has been largely fractured and leading to the drawing, the, the, the circles, the complexity. And I, I think that uh, when showing that, I possibly should have said that this is not necessarily a bad thing. And whether the developer of the King's Cross scheme would agree with me, 
Uh, I think the six years we negotiated the scheme was a very, very rich negotiation. He might have preferred two years. Uh, but during that, uh, we used the complexities of the various stakeholders to come to, I think, a kind of very interesting understanding of the problem. And in many ways, uh, it's a bit like solving a very, very complex set of mathematical equations that you, you sketch out to your stakeholders, you work out what their agendas are then either side of the line, you, you can cancel, you can reduce. Uh, because in many ways, if you can agree a set of very, very simple objectives and visions, then you'll find that 90% of the agendas will probably align, and you can cancel those. Uh, the 10%, you can then negotiate, and you can negotiate those out. And finally, you're left with some pretty tough decisions at the end of it, but you can reduce. I think the process uh, within the kind of cities we're trying to design uh, is complex, but in many ways, if we understand, if we know how to use it, I think it can produce far richer solutions than some of the processes we've used in the past. I think we should conclude this session by uh, just thinking together about the fact that, as it happens, the next city we're going to visit is Chicago, uh, and this year is uh, the hundredth, uh, it's the centenary of one of the greatest, um, in the global north anyway, uh, one of the greatest urban planners of all, uh, Daniel Burnham who um, in 1909 came up with the statement, which not many of us would like around the table, or some of us would, uh, which is make no little plans. So the only way you're going to actually get anything done is come up with a fantastically strong and powerful three-dimensional visionary idea, which sort of pulls the city forward. And in that case, uh, there was no doubt that Chicago was transformed as a result of um, uh, what he came up with, these extraordinary drawings uh, which got the business community and the political community behind him. I think of that, but I also think of um, Oriol Bojigas, the Spanish architect who, in fact, did the master plan for the Olympic Games in 1992 with uh, the mayor of uh, Barcelona, who was here. And he, in fact, comes at it exactly the opposite way. That's why I was asking both of you, which is, don't make any master plans. They don't work. By the time it's been approved, it's going to take 10 years. The world has changed, uh, the economy has changed, society has changed, we've just seen what's happened in the last six to nine months, uh, and master plans can be very inflexible. So he fact, says master planning should be done not with master plans, but with uh, uh, what he calls progetti puntuali, punctual projects, petit projet, the sort of let many million flowers bloom, that sort of approach. Now clearly that can't work without a sort of overall framework. I think I would like to conclude with uh, Koran Gumus and I to uh, think of this debate in terms of these two parameters. You know, make no little plans or do lots of petit projet. But whatever you do, plan and involve the whole cross-section of community. Can you join me in thanking these very, very strong speakers and comments? Thank you.